Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, we are continuing our study uh, through the road to Calvary. We are in part three, which is titled, Be Filled Now. And today we're going to cover the last three sections of this small book. Now, friends, it is truly my prayer that this study has touched you and transformed you by the power of the Holy Spirit into the meek, gentle, and lowly character of the Lord Jesus whom we seek to follow. If you are just joining us in this study, I highly recommend that you go back and listen to book one and book two. If you feel that you have missed something, I certainly invite you to go back and re-listen to the series. Now, before we begin chapter 6 today, which is titled, Four Attitudes to the Holy Spirit, I'd like to introduce you to a small book entitled, Humility, by Andrew Murray. This will be the next book that we'll be looking at, and it's subtitled, The Journey Toward Holiness, which is a perfect follow-up to the study that we're now in, And I can truly tell you that this book has changed my life. And I'm trusting the Almighty through it to do the same thing for you. Well, again, we're going to cover chapters 6, 7, and 8, which are the final three chapters in The Road to Calvary, part 3. And today is titled, Four Attitudes to the Holy Spirit. Having seen the place and function of the Holy Spirit among the people of God, we are in a position to ask ourselves, What is our attitude to him? Are we allowing him to do his work of conviction and revealing Jesus to us as all we need? The New Testament tells us that there are four possible attitudes that we may take up towards him. The first is to grieve him. We are told in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 30 to 31, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath anger and clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Sin is that which grieves him, especially those sins which are mentioned here in the context. Bitterness, anger, evil speaking of others, malice, and unforgiveness. When we understand that the one whom he has come to reveal to us is called by that precious name of the Lamb, meek and lowly in heart, and that he himself is likened to the gentle dove, we can see the sort of things that do grieve him. Whenever we manifest a disposition other than that of the lamb, and if we were to be honest, we would have to say our disposition often is more like a lion. But if we are to manifest a disposition other than that of the lamb, especially in our relationships with others, we cause him grief. Although we have been forgiven so much ourselves, We sometimes stand on our rights and refuse to forgive another. He cannot go further with us in his work of blessing until we see these sins and repent of them. For that reason, he proceeds to convict us of them and strive with us. But it is ever the work of love. Our sins do not anger him, but rather grieve him. The second possible attitude that we can adopt towards him is, is to resist him. Stephen said to the Jews of his day in Acts chapter 7 verse 51, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. When the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, we can resist him. We can refuse to call something sin, which he calls sin. We sometimes work out a complete alibi for ourselves, which proves us guiltless. We do so because we know that to say yes to the Spirit's conviction would humble us, for we should have to repent and put the thing right. This is what the scriptures call being stiff-necked, and it is indeed a serious condition to be in, and may lead to solemn judgments upon us if persisted in. In Proverbs chapter 29 verse 1, we are told, He that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Our resistance to the Holy Spirit's conviction 
is seen so often in our refusal to accept the challenge of some brother or sister in Christ. We would not mind if his conviction were direct from himself to our hearts, but very often he uses somebody else's penetrating words to show us our sin. And that makes it doubly hard to receive because of our pride. But we must receive it nonetheless if we are to be blessed. The third possible attitude is that of quenching him. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 and 20, quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings. This is the word concerning the more corporate activities of the Holy Spirit in our midst, as is seen by the phrase that follows that we are not to despise prophesyings. We quench a fire when we pour water upon it. And we quench the fire of the Holy Spirit's working in another, in a fellowship, in a meeting, by pouring cold water upon it, by way of discouraging or actually forbidding it. The Holy Spirit demands to have right away in the congregating of God's people and in their fellowship. But so often we have a mental picture of the way in which he must work, and we forbid all forms of his working which do not conform exactly to our ideas especially those forms that would seem to bypass our own pet methods and would seem to make nothing of our own special position. How prone we are to think that if revival is to come, it must come through the minister or the missionary or only through those who have special training. The Spirit, however, often brings revival through the back door, through someone of no account at all and of little official position. How often has not the Lord Jesus come knocking at the door of a situation, a church, or a mission station, but the door has been bolted against him because he did not come through the proper channels or along normal lines, and thus he had sadly to turn away from a situation that needed him so desperately. The fourth attitude that we can take to the Spirit's working is to be filled with him. The epistle of the Ephesians tells us, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. You'll find this in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. The one whom we are grieving, resisting, and quenching is now filling us and possessing us. What a capitulation and what a reversal this implies on our part. We have at last consented to bow to his conviction and call sin, sin. He is now able without hindrance to give us continual sight of Jesus as all we need to our immense joy, release, and empowering. When thinking of this matter of being filled with the Holy Spirit, it is important always to do so in the context of these three other attitudes to the Spirit. If we do not do so, we shall always be regarding the fullness of the Holy Spirit as a special blessing, extra to our inheritance in Christ, and that attitude will lead us only to striving and frustration. If we are not filled with the Spirit at any given moment, it is only because of one thing, sin. Through sin we have grieved Him, and we resist Him where He has convicted us. Maybe we have been in a dry, unsatisfied condition for years, but it is all due to an accumulation of this same one thing, sin. But we have only to humble ourselves in repentance under the Holy Spirit's conviction, and he will witness in our hearts to Jesus and his blood, and enable us to believe that his blood cleanses what we have confessed. Then, where the blood cleanses, the Holy Spirit fills and that without further waiting on our part. This is clearly illustrated in the ceremonial cleansing of the leper in the book of Leviticus, chapter 14. First of all, the blood of a sacrificial victim, a lamb, was placed upon his right ear, his right thumb, and his right big toe. Then the holy anointing oil, which is a picture to us of the Holy Spirit, was placed upon the blood in those same three places. First the blood, then the oil. And so it is in the experience of the believer. The Holy Spirit does not fill and empower the flesh that is unjudged self. 
He only comes where there has been repentance and where the blood of Christ has been applied to sin by and through faith. Such is the value of the precious blood to God, that, be a man never such a failure, if he has truly repented, that blood gives him the title to expect the Holy Spirit immediately to fill his heart and life. He need go no further than the foot of the cross, right there where sin is washed away. If his faith will receive it, the Holy Spirit will fill him and his cup will be running over. I remember when a fellow worker and myself were taking part in a minister's conference in Brazil. A young American missionary flew in from his station in the mission aircraft. A great hunger of heart had brought him. In conversation, he told us of the barrenness on their station and the defeat in his own life. There had only been one professed conversion in their area in the whole year. The missionaries had got so cold that if one of them would seek to talk seriously about the Lord, the others would jokingly say, he's talking like a missionary. He told us how recently the Lord had begun to work in his heart again and had shown him things of which he must repent to get right with God. In some matters, it meant putting things right with his fellow missionaries. He told us how as a result, a new fellowship had begun to grow up between the missionaries and there was a new touch of blessing on the work. We suggested he might give his testimony in the meeting later that day. Well, he did so, and as he concluded what was an impressive story of the Lord humbling him and bringing him back to the cross, he said, however, I cannot say that I am filled with the Spirit yet, but I am seeking. Afterwards, I drew him aside and said, while I praise God for your testimony, I was disappointed to hear you say that you are not yet filled with the Spirit. As we talked further, he began to see that he did not need to go any further than the cross to be filled with the Spirit. In that place of brokenness, where the blood was applied to his heart, Jesus was made to him all he needed. And inasmuch as he had come to the cross, God did indeed fill him with the Spirit because of the blood of Christ, if his faith would receive it. There, he began to believe in the value of the blood of Jesus on his behalf. In those days, he could be seen in quiet corners, under the trees and elsewhere, bowed in wonder and worship, believing it all, cleansed in the blood, therefore filled with the Spirit, and Jesus made to him all he needed, his righteousness with God and his holiness within. He returned to his station radiant, emancipated, as he humbly gave his testimony there, the Lord began to use his testimony to make others hungry. Christians began to repent, and others began to seek Christ for the first time. He wrote back, It's rivers of living water again. How simple and how well within our reach is God's way of being filled with his Spirit. Chapter 7, which is titled, Be Filled and Be Filled Now. Ephesians 5, 18 through 21 tells us to be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Let us take a moment and look more closely at this great apostolic word, be filled with the Spirit. And let us note the grammar involved in that word, be filled, for it has helpful lessons to teach us. First, it is in the imperative mood, which means it is a command. It is just as much a command of God to be filled with the Spirit as it is not to be drunk with wine which is the phrase that immediately precedes it. If we are not cleansed by the blood of Christ and filled with God's Spirit, we are disobeying God. To be filled with the Spirit is not optional, but obligatory on every Christian, whether a housewife, a businessman, or a preacher. Indeed, that fullness is as much commanded at the sink as it is in the pulpit 
and it is not commanded for our compliance at some future date, but now. Secondly, this verb, be filled, is in the passive voice. It is not fill yourself, but be filled. It is something that is done to us, not something we can do ourselves. This implies that all we have to offer is emptiness. If only we were more content to take that position before God, we would be more often filled, instead of which we are all the time making attempts to come other than as empty sinners and to meet our own needs when we should instead be letting him do it. Being filled with the Spirit is not an attainment, but an obtainment, obtained through simple faith by those who know and acknowledge their emptiness. They were saved by grace without works, and they expect to be filled on the same principle. A word of testimony may help here. On one occasion, there had been real defeat in my walk as a Christian, and I was much oppressed with a sense of failure. I turned idly to a notebook of mine and saw two words which I had scribbled there some time before, be filled. They seemed to come as a direct word from God to me. But Lord, I said, I am such a failure. I know, he replied, but be filled. But not so soon after defeat, I said, I must surely improve first. You need do nothing of the sort first, he said. Be filled and be filled now. But how can I when I feel so oppressed with my sin? The blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin, he replied patiently. Be filled and be filled now. Be filled, be filled, be filled was all that came back to me in reply to every doubtful thought. This was the last message I would have expected from God that day. To go from the lowest to the highest so immediately seemed impossible. But when I saw the power of the blood of Jesus to cleanse completely, I could only bow my head and say, yes, Lord, to both his command and his promise and receiving the cleansing and the filling. A day of rich blessing followed and others got something from the overflow. The simple truth is that the fullness of the Holy Spirit is not merely for super saints who by their consecration and devotedness may be deemed to have qualified, but sinners and failures who have learned to repent and who see the perfect, present cleansing available to them in and through the blood of Jesus. Thank God, whereas this word is in the imperative mood, it is also in the passive voice. This simply means that it is of faith, that it might be by grace, and this in turn means that the promise might be sure to all the seed, Romans 4.16. Not only to saints of high attainments, but to feeble, failing people like most of us. Grace, by its very nature, makes the promise sure to failures who admit their failure, and they can do that now. Someone has said, the Spirit's fullness is not the reward of our faithfulness, but instead it is God's gift for our defeat. He was not given to the disciples in Acts 28 as the culmination and reward of their wonderful service, but in Acts 2 when they had proved themselves cowards, meeting behind barred doors. There is therefore no need to struggle for self-improvement first, for that is to seek the Holy Spirit not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. Nor is there any need to wait for him, as some have thought. No need to wait, that is to say, any longer than it takes us to be willing to call sin, sin, and then come to the cross with that sin. The Holy Spirit has already been given. True, the disciples were of old told, tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high, Luke twenty four forty nine. But that was simply because the historic moment of the giving of the Holy Spirit had not yet come. But now that he is given, all may be filled and filled now. The third thing to note about the word be filled is that it is in the present continuous tense. This, of course, is not apparent in the English translation. Indeed, in the English language, 
We do not use the present continuous tense at all. In the Greek, however, this word here, be filled, is literally be being filled. In other words, it is not a command that we be filled once for all or even occasionally, but that we be filled continually. It's not a static experience. The figure the Lord Jesus uses of the fullness of the Spirit in John chapter 4 is of a spring of water leaping up in us. When it says, the water that I shall give him will become in him a spring of water welling up unto eternal life. There is nothing very static about that. The fact that we are to go on being filled with the Spirit is of tremendous importance. And I would beg the listener to give special attention to this point. Unless we go on being filled with the Spirit, the great initial experience by which we may have begun will become but a memory of the past, while in the present we are empty, defeated, and dry. Indeed, it is a sad and rather depressing thing to hear a man tell of a past filling, if he cannot tell you of a present one too. The fact of his silence about the present is often an indication that nothing is happening in the present. Indeed, I had better be silent about my testimony of what happened further back in the past if I have not a testimony of his fullness right now in the present. The honest fact is that sometimes nothing is happening in the present with us, in spite of all of our experience in the past. The blessing is ours today as we continue in his light today. But one refusal of the light, one refusal to accept conviction at any point, however small, will block the flow of the Holy Spirit. But the command to be filled that came to us yesterday comes to us again today in our present condition. And the blood that cleansed us yesterday will cleanse us today if we will repent today. And the Lord Jesus who filled our cups to overflowing yesterday will do the same today. Our need for a continuous filling with the Spirit is matched by the continuous cleansing from sin which the blood of Christ imparts. Indeed, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 has another of these hidden present continuous tenses. It should read, If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, goes on cleansing us from all sin. You see, this continuous cleansing is, however, not automatic. It only goes on cleansing as we go on walking in the light. That is, we go on saying yes to what that light reveals, which in turn means we go on repenting. A lady missionary from East Africa told me how she was greeted once by the African Christian leaders who asked her, are you praising the Lord this morning, sister? If you want to know the truth, I'm not, she replied, not this morning. Why is that, he asked. After a moment's hesitation, she replied softly, I lost my temper in my bungalow this morning. All he answered was, has the blood of Jesus lost its power? And then he quietly moved on. That was just the message she needed. She saw in that moment that the blood had not lost its power. And it was not long before that she had come to the Lord in repentance and been cleansed and filled afresh with a consequent new testimony of praise to him. Even the most outstanding initial experience of being filled with the Spirit can only be maintained by a constant readiness to be cleansed in the blood of Christ from the smallest things as they come. Without such continuous cleansing and continuous fullness, the great initial experience will become little more than a sad memory, which only accuses us of our present emptiness and coldness. Indeed, a conspicuous experience in the past has sometimes proved to be a lifelong liability to a man, for he is always haunted by the memory of that experience, which in spite of his struggles, he cannot regain. But if we are willing to walk in the light as Jesus is in the light, saying yes quickly to all that that light reveals as sin, the blood of Jesus will keep on cleansing us from all sin. Grace will restore what sin has taken away, 
and our experience of the Spirit's fullness will be fresh and up to date. All this has many important implications, one of them being in the matter of fellowship. The fact that some Christians have had an experience of the gifts of the Spirit, let's say speaking in tongues, healing, or something like them, and some have not, this has sometimes imposed a strain on their fellowship one with another. The fact that a man has had an experience of the gifts of the Spirit will not of itself prevent sin from coming into his heart. And once it has come, no harking back to those past experiences or endeavoring to gain new ones will restore his peace. For that, he must come to the cross of the Lord Jesus as a sinner, as empty as if he had never had any great experiences. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can wash away his stain and make him whole again. There he will meet others who have likewise found the inability of their respective doctrinal backgrounds to help them in their time of need and who are repenting at the cross. There is not a thing to choose between the whole lot of them. They are just a bunch of sinners, but sinners who are finding for that very reason the middle walls of partition between them broken down and themselves having fellowship, sweet loving fellowship with one another. If we were only willing to live more on the basis of a now relationship with God, we would find the fancied ground of our superiority to one another crumbling beneath our feet. In the now, we would have to confess sometimes that things had gone wrong with us. And in the now, we would have to find our way to the feet of Jesus for restoration. There we would find ourselves drawn in love to others who were being equally honest. No harking back to past experiences then can take the place of this honest dealing with God in the present. But this dealing with God is not all repentance. It is faith as well. And faith, as someone has said, is not asking God for what we have not got, but making use of what God says we have. It is our response simply to God's word. The word comes to us and faith believes and says, thank you, Lord. But the word has got to come to us or else faith is merely an effort of our own. To illustrate, I may quote my experience in writing this book. As I was at work on the earlier part, my mind seemed dull and lifeless and my heart uninspired. I said to myself, if ever there was a time when I did not feel filled with the Spirit, it is now. And yet I am trying to write about it. In that condition, I was tempted to strive in prayer and ask God desperately for what I felt I did not have. I just had not the strength to do any such agonizing. Along that line, I felt defeated before I began. I felt also that to go hunting around in my heart for something to repent of would also be mere self-effort. At an end of myself, I could only tell the Lord my condition. That morning, in my reading, God's word came to me. It was the first text in the devotional that I was reading. It said, you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. God said I had it. As I turned to my Bible and read further, I saw that the passage went on to say, And as for you, the anointing which you received of him abideth in you. I saw that he said that the anointing I had received of him abides, or to use another word, remains. It does not change. It was God who said I had this, and it did not change. I did not have to think it up. It was God's given word to me in my needy condition. How safe then to turn from my feelings or lack of my feelings to receive the word and say, thank you, Lord. And how quickly new life, enlargement of heart and help came to me from the Holy Spirit. I saw again the truth that faith is not asking for what we have not got, but by making use of what God says we have. I give it as my experience that I have never come out of coldness and deadness except by faith. For even where repentance seems to be the dominant act, there yet has to be faith. 
Never has deliverance come by some longed-for climatic experience suddenly hitting me. There has certainly been the longing for some such experience and the praying for it. But the feebleness, the tenderness of my desires and of my praying has made me despair and give up ere I had begun. Then his word came to me, declaring some blessed fact of grace. Then faith, believing it to be true, followed by God's performance of that which was declared and promised, so that one could say at the end, He hath both spoken unto me, and himself hath done it. Experiences, there have been plenty of them, but invariably always following faith. In the light of all these rich provisions of his grace, do we not hear him say to us, Be filled, and be filled now? Chapter 8, The Consequences of the Spirit's Fullness Having considered the Apostle's word, Be filled with the Spirit, we must now pass on to consider the rest of the passage, which goes on to describe the filling of the Spirit as to its consequences. The results are delineated in detail, but they are not the results sometimes associated in our minds with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Nothing is said here of the Spirit making us wonderful preachers or spectacular Christians in some special way. The results mentioned seem much more earthbound than that, and it is well that it is so, for many of us may never be given by God outstanding spheres of service. His work is to make us normal so that we walk with him all our days in what seem to be the most ordinary of paths. The first result of being filled with the Spirit is a song of praise to the Lord in our heart. The words that immediately follow, be filled with the Spirit, are speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Again, Ephesians 5.19. That means overflowing with such praise and testimony to the Lord Jesus, for a newly filled person is full of Jesus. And such melody making in the heart to the Lord can be just as real in the kitchen as in the minister's study. Indeed, there is more victory in the kitchen where a wife has learned to walk with the Lord Jesus than there is in the minister's study where a minister has not. This melody making, however, is thoroughly rational. It is not merely the result of an emotional uplift. The fullness of the Spirit means nothing if it does not mean the Spirit showing us continually Jesus in his various aspects, enough for all of our needs. Our vision is just full of Christ and of his grace, and we cannot help but sing. As Charles Wesley puts it, My heart is full of Christ, and longs its glorious master to declare. Of him I make my loftier songs. I cannot from his praise forbear. This is precisely what followed as one of the first consequences of the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2 verse 11 tells us the people that were standing near said, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. The fact that the disciples were speaking in other languages was quite incidental. The important thing was the subject of their speech, and that was the wonderful works of God. Praise to God was what they were engaged in, and that because the Holy Spirit had shown them Jesus risen from the dead, standing at the right hand of God for them, ready to give repentance to Israel and remission of sins. It was the wonder of the grace of God in all this that evoked their praise to God that day. It was basically a simple fulfillment of the promise of the Lord when he said, He shall glorify us, for he shall receive of us and show it unto us. Their praise, their joy, their boldness were all the consequence of what they were given to see by the Spirit. Their speaking in other tongues was also the result of what they saw. Their hearts were so full of the vision of Jesus that they went beyond the bounds of speech known to them in their praise to God 
and it became a sign to all those gathered at Jerusalem. The miraculous speaking in other languages would have been utterly insignificant had they not been expressing what the Spirit was revealing to them of Jesus. So often in our thinking, we associate being filled with the Holy Spirit with inspiring sensations, ecstatic joy, and the ability to praise God with a new boldness and freedom, and to do so sometimes in other tongues. We can come to regard these as the principal things to expect and seek them accordingly. It cannot be too strongly emphasized that they are not the Spirit's principal gift to us. His principal gift to us is to take of the things of Christ and show them unto us. Joy and praise to God follow as a simple consequence, for it is infinitely good news for helpless people like ourselves that we see in Him. The resultant praise that follows can be in either a known or an unknown tongue. Paul said that he would infinitely prefer it to be in a known tongue so that others can join in and receive the benefit of it. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 19. And we imagine most people would agree with him. If we make the mistake of seeking these things as his principal gifts, we shall be disappointed if we do not receive them or in danger of making too much of them if we do. But if we are expecting the Holy Spirit to give us a new revelation of Jesus, we shall soon be speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts unto the Lord as the text has told us. Our joy will have a rational foundation and we shall be able so to speak to others of what we see that they too will be able to see the same and then join us in our rejoicing. The second result mentioned is thanksgiving for all things. We're told, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This means seeing God in everything and knowing that all the things that come to us, no matter from what sources they begin, by the time they reach us, they come to us as God's permissive will, who works all things together for good to them that love God. That being so, they must be something for which to thank God, whether we see how they can be for good or not. Such an attitude of thanksgiving is quite impossible if we are proud and unwilling to give up our rights and our self-centeredness to God. Self-pity and complaining can be the only result in that case. But this precious thankfulness is closely associated with being filled with the Spirit. For God can only fill valleys, empty places, not mountains. Whether such brokenness as submits and rejoices in all that God allows is the condition or consequence of the Spirit's fullness, it is difficult to say. Probably it is both. In this passage, it is given as the result of the Spirit's fullness. On the other hand, the lack of this submissiveness produces sins of self-pity, murmuring and doubting, which make it impossible for us to be filled, and which must first be confessed and cleansed in the blood of Christ. Quite obviously, our repentance and cleansing on this point alone will have to be often reiterated, for whoever went through any of the severe tests to which we are all at one time or another subjected without at least at first reacting in a self-centered way. But how gracious God is to restore our attitude when we acknowledge our wrong. The third result mentioned, and this is perhaps the most important judging by the amount of space allotted to it in the passage, this would be mutual submission. We are told to submit ourselves one to another in the fear of God. Whenever God speaks of our relationships one with another, the word he gives us is always submit, be in subjection. In this passage, each relationship of life has this light directed upon it. Wives are to submit themselves unto their own husbands as unto the Lord, Ephesians 5.22. What a searching word this is today when petticoat government is not merely a playful phrase, but a real fact, 
when bossing and nagging are an accepted part in our homes. But believers must confess this if they are to be filled with the Spirit. Then Paul passes on to husbands. They are not called to submit to their wives, it is true, for Paul is at pains in other places to emphasize the headship of the man. But the husband is required to do something even more humbling. He is to love his wife as Jesus loves his church and gave himself for it. Christ's love for the church was a self-giving love, and the melting thing about it is that it led the senior to humble himself to serve the junior. In the same self-giving way, husbands are to love their wives. Though in Scripture they are the acknowledged seniors, before the cross they cannot stand on those rights. And though senior, they are to give themselves to serve the junior, the weaker vessel, and to make her great, even as Christ did for them. How this strikes at male selfishness and male pride, and how surely must the believer confess it if it should be manifested. The same pattern of submission on one side and a self-giving caring on the other is seen in what is said with regard to the other relationships mentioned in the passage. Children are to submit to and obey their parents in the Lord. And when it speaks of children here, it most certainly includes teenagers. Parents, on the other hand, while bringing up their families with godly discipline, are to avoid needlessly provoking resentment in their children by their lack of understanding or harshness. Employees are to submit to their employers, doing them service as if they were serving Christ himself. The boss, on the other hand, is to have a concern for the welfare of his employees, not threatening or mistreating them, being aware that he himself has a boss in heaven, who may well want to have him on the mat as to the way he is treating those whom he employs. Mutual submission and caring in all the relationships of life is one of the consequences of the Spirit's fullness. The bending of the stiff neck is ever God's way for us if we are to enjoy a Christ-filled heart, a Spirit-filled life. Let us, however, never lose sight of the fact that the way to be filled is not by trying to be more submissive or caring, but rather by repenting that we have not submitted to this one or the other and confessing that we have not loved them as we should. God reckons the blood of his Son covering what we thus confess, and the Spirit feels where the blood has cleansed, producing in us a sweet willingness to submit and love others. Let us, therefore, set out in full this blessed and challenging passage, which gives us the cause and consequence of the Spirit-filled life. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Again, that is found in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. And that brings us to the end, friends, of our three-part series. We will next be looking at a book entitled Humility, The Journey Toward Holiness, written by Andrew Murray. Now until then, and as the Lord wills, may your heart's desire be to wash feet rather than to sit on thrones. I truly love you, friends, and I'll see you on the next video.